Normally, the greatest danger you're likely to encounter at a theme park is agonizingly long lines, sweaty crowds of tourists, and the unfortunate outcome of eating two corn dogs and an extra large churro right before getting on one of those spinny rides. But sometimes a day of fun in the sun, screaming with glee on roller coasters, turns dark, and lives are lost in the process. Today, we're taking a look at the times when amusement parks weren't so amusing anymore. Ride malfunctions, human error, or horrible freak accidents, we have it all. Strap in, and for the love of all that's holy, please keep your arms and legs inside for the duration of the experience. It's Dumb Ways to Die, Theme Park Edition. It might seem obvious now that one of the world's first wooden roller coasters was probably not the safest ride in the world. But back in 1911, when the Derby Racer was first unveiled in Massachusetts, a lot of park goers didn't think twice about buying a ticket for the ride. This was decades before we realized that we should stop putting asbestos in everything. So you gotta cut the people of the past a little bit of slack here. But even with all that slack, there's no excuse for certain choices. For example, it's pretty ironic that in June 1911, the treasurer of the roller coaster company responsible for the Derby Racer fell to his death after standing up on the ride to provide a lecture to the rest of the passengers about safety. This came right on the heels of another death linked to the coaster, and it wouldn't stop there. Restraints were installed following those two deaths, but they weren't enough to keep people from perishing on the Derby Racer. In 1917, a man lost his hat as the coaster climbed a steep incline, and while attempting to retrieve it, he fell from the roller coaster. He died after breaking almost every bone in his body. If there had only been someone on the ride with him to give him a lecture on safety. It's common for high school seniors to pull pranks and get up to all kinds of wild stunts during the chaotic transitional time between high school and the big bad world of adulthood. But theme park rides are probably not the best place to try to push boundaries. The consequences can be disastrous. In June 1997, a group of seniors from Napa High School decided to attempt and break the record for clogging a ride, selecting the Bonsai Pipeline at Waterworld USA as their target. On a pre-graduation trip to the park, they put their senior prank into action, barreling past the lifeguard on duty in spite of the park's one-person-at-a-time policy for the ride. Dozens of students piled into the mouth of the three-story slide, ready to carry out their planned prank. But a few seconds after they entered the slide, witnesses heard a loud crack of the structure splintering apart. The slide broke about eight feet from the top, filling the air with water and screams. A nearby student who hadn't participated in the prank could see blood mixing with the water as dozens of people fell from the sky. 32 people were injured and one student fell to her death. As frustrating as it can be to wait in a long line, as only one person enters the ride at a time, the safety precautions tend to be in place for a reason. Wait your turn, kids. Don't crowd in with a bunch of your friends. It's just not worth it. Would you pay 40 pounds to climb up an enormous medieval-style catapult and be flung into the air at a pace of 60 miles an hour, hoping to land safely in a net 75 feet away? We wouldn't blame you if you answered no, and it's probably the best response because things didn't end well for Middlemore Water Park in the UK after they introduced the human trebuchet. The ride, if you can call it that, was exactly what it sounds like. A trebuchet that sent humans careening through the air toward a net. Seems fine, totally safe. No chance of things going horribly, horribly wrong at all. In November 2002, members of Oxford University's extreme sports club, the Oxford Stunt Factory, visited Middlemore Park in Somerset in order to try out the trebuchet for themselves. Stella Young, the partner of one of the trebuchet's creators, Richard Wicks, tested a prototype of the trebuchet in May 2000. When she did so, she hit the safety net, bounced in, then bounced out, breaking her pelvis in three places. Young tended to warn jumpers about her experience before they tried the trebuchet themselves, advising them that it was still a very, very dangerous thing to do. Still, the thrill seekers would not be deterred. Well, one of them would be actually Oliver Nelkin. A member of the group who was planning to jump grew concerned about the safety of the endeavor when he noticed that the jumpers were landing right at the front of the safety net, rather than the middle. It was too close of a call for him, and he made the right choice because the club member who went right before him, a 19-year-old student, missed the safety net and hit the ground with a thud. He was rushed to the hospital but did not survive the injuries he incurred during the fall. In this case, the extreme sport experience was a bit too extreme, and the human trebuchet was closed down for good. It's common for theme parks to try to outdo each other with their various attractions. Everyone wants to have the tallest roller coaster, the most loops, the fastest speeds. But sometimes the rush to outperform the other parks ends up breaking a lot more than just records. The owners of Schlitterbahn Water Park in Kansas City, Kansas were determined to build the world's tallest water slide. So determined, they ignored design flaws 
and cut corners to get the ride finished in only 20 months from conception to public opening. But who cares about the little things like engineering standards and minimizing risk when you're trying to sell as many tickets as possible? Verrucht was for better or worse, spoiler alert worse, available to the public in July 2014. It was certainly an impressive ride. Riders who chose to ride Verrucht would climb 264 steps to the top, then sit in a raft that would plummet from 17 stories in the air, flying down to a pool at the bottom. There was netting along the length of the slide intended to keep any riders from falling off. However, there was another issue that had not been addressed. The rafts tended to get quite a lot of air at the crest of the ride, putting passengers' heads uncomfortably close to the netting and the poles that held it in place. In August 2016, the worst-case scenario unfolded when a raft flew up a bit too high, knocking a 10-year-old boy's head into a metal pole, which decapitated him. The park and its former operations director were subsequently charged with involuntary manslaughter, aggravated endangering of a child, and aggravated battery. Even the most famous theme parks in the world aren't free from the dark shadow of tragedy and death. Disneyland is frequently called the happiest place on Earth, but it's been the site of several unhappy accidents over the years. One of the most iconic rides at the park, the Matterhorn, has seen two deaths since its opening. In May 1964, five years after the Matterhorn opened, a teenage boy was at the park for an after-hours Elks Club event with his brothers and classmates. As the bobsled began to descend, one of his friends felt the boy bump into him, but it was too dark to see what was actually happening. When one of the other boys looked up, he recognized his friend's sweater falling over the side of the sled. There's a great deal of debate around what exactly happened, but Disneyland officials claimed he had unbuckled his seatbelt and stood up on the ride, hitting his head on the concrete mountain. Twenty years later, there was another death on the Matterhorn. A 48-year-old woman was riding with several friends sitting on her own in the back of the bobsled. Several other riders saw her fall out of the bobsled cart and land on the tracks, where she was killed. Just like before, the exact cause of her fall couldn't be determined, but her seatbelt was open on her empty seat, indicating that she could have stood up at some point during the ride. The Matterhorn may be one of the most recognizable rides where a Disneyland death has occurred, but it is far from the only one. The People Mover, a transport attraction located in Tomorrowland, is one notable example. It involves a series of small train cars that guests can ride around in on elevated tracks, and people just can't seem to stop jumping between the cars and climbing onto the tracks. In August 1967, a teenage boy attempted to jump between two moving cars while the ride passed through a tunnel. He lost his balance and fell onto the track where he was crushed by an oncoming train of cars. This was only a month after the attraction opened, so it was not off to a great start. Then, in 1972, four teenage girls were riding the People Mover, when one of them realized she had lost her mouse ears hat. You can probably guess what happened next, but we'll tell you anyway. She and her cousin jumped onto the track to retrieve the hat, and one of them fell into a guardrail and dropped 30 feet onto the concrete below. She broke several bones, but miraculously managed to survive. Still, a hat is never worth your life or your safety. You can get another hat, but you can't get more bones. The next guest to jump off the People Mover car wasn't so lucky. In June 1980, another teenage boy jumped between the moving cars, falling onto the ground where he was crushed and killed by the train. Some Disneyland accidents are caused by guests disregarding safety precautions, but others were the fault of the park. On September 5, 2003, a 22-year-old man was riding Big Thunder Mountain Railroad when the roller coaster derailed, injuring 10 other riders as well. This derailment was caused by a mechanical failure that occurred due to oversights during a maintenance procedure. Fasteners were not tightened appropriately, causing an axle to come loose and jam against a brake section. The car then came loose and hit the ceiling of the tunnel, and the locomotive fell on top of the first passenger car, crushing a man to death. In June of 1973, a pair of brothers stayed on Tom Sawyer's island past closing time, hiding out in an off-limits area to avoid detection. When they decided to leave the island, they tried to swim across the rivers of America, but the younger brother didn't know how to swim. While trying to carry his brother on his back, the older boy drowned. This was not the only drowning in the rivers of America. In June 1983, an 18-year-old boy was trying to pilot a stolen rubber emergency boat with a friend. The two teenagers were intoxicated at the time, and the boy drowned when he lost control of the boat. His mother attempted to sue Disneyland for allowing her son on the premises while under the influence, but it was unsuccessful. One of the recorded deaths at Disneyland didn't even involve a ride. In June 1966, a 19-year-old boy tried to sneak into the park by climbing onto the monorail track. 
A security guard attempted to stop him, but he ignored the warnings and was promptly hit by the train cruising on the monorail and dragged 30 feet down the track before his body could be recovered. In June 2008, a teenager hopped a pair of fences and entered a restricted area at Six Flags Over Georgia. Witnesses said he was looking to retrieve a hat he had lost while riding the Batman roller coaster. Again with the hats! He scaled two six-foot fences and passed several warning signs in order to get to the dangerous area, and he happened to wander into the path of the Batman roller coaster. The dangling leg of one of the passengers struck him in the head, and he was decapitated. Ten years earlier, another man made a similar fail error when he climbed over a chain-link fence at Paramount's Great America in search of a hat he lost on the Top Gun roller coaster. While in the restricted area, the ride passed by and a woman's dangling foot struck him in the head. He didn't lose his head, but he did lose his life. We'll say it again, the hat is never worth it, just let the hat go, please. But enough about the risks of trying to recover a lost hat during the day at the theme park, let's talk about some more safety violations. Australia is known for being a pretty dangerous country, but that's usually due to deadly wildlife native to the country rather than anything to do with its theme parks or hats. But the Australian theme park Dream World became more of a nightmare world in 2016. The park hadn't assessed the safety of the ride in 30 years when the inevitable occurred, an accident that killed four riders. Sadly, egregious safety errors aren't as uncommon at theme parks as one might hope. In the summer of 2010, a 12-year-old girl hopped on Terminal Velocity, a ride at Extreme World in Wisconsin. The ride would terrifyingly drop riders over 100 feet onto a safety net without the use of any harnesses. In an abhorrent lapse of judgment, the ride's operator released the girl without the safety net in place. She fell over 100 feet down onto nothing but concrete breaking her back and pelvis and suffering brain damage. She actually managed to survive but could have easily been another entry on the list. Crashes, falls, and decapitations are more common ways for someone to die at a theme park, but they're not the only ones. In 1984, the haunted castle at Six Flags Great Adventure was the site of a truly awful incident. Eight people were inside when a fire started, possibly by a guest using a lighter, in order to see a particularly dark passageway. This was never confirmed, but what was confirmed is the park's dodging of safety procedures. Because it was built on semi-trailers, it was considered a temporary structure that didn't have to adhere to the same building codes as permanent structures. There were no adequate sprinklers, smoke alarms, or fire retardant material. Most disturbingly, eight victims were all within 25 feet of a fire exit when they died. No discussion of unfortunate and avoidable theme park deaths would be complete without mentioning Action Park. A theme park so wildly dangerous it earned the nicknames Accident Park, Friction Park, Traction Park, and Class Action Park. Action Park was an amusement and water park built by Gene Mulvihill in Vernon Township, New Jersey on the grounds of a former ski resort. The park was first opened to the public in 1978 and quickly gained attention from locals for its unique attractions, as well as its poor design, underage and often intoxicated staff, and a generally rocky relationship with safety. In fact, its reputation became so notorious that it became the subject of a documentary entitled Class Action Park, detailing the history of the park and its many, many, many accidents. One of the most popular attractions at Action Park during its reign of terror was the Alpine Slide, a 2,700-foot-long track made from concrete, fiberglass, and asbestos that guests would rocket down on small sleds equipped with a brake-slash-accelerator stick, though those were often broken. What could go wrong? As it turns out, a lot. Between 1984 and 1985, there were 14 recorded fractures and 26 recorded head injuries caused by the slide. But they got off easy compared to one 19-year-old parkgoer who boarded the slide to find that the brake on his sled was broken. Tragically, he discovered this too late, and his sled ran off the track, throwing the young man into an embankment. He did not survive the fall. Action Park founder Gene Mulvihill attempted to claim that the young man was an employee who had snuck onto the ride at night, but the victim's family disputed that story. It was likely invented by Mulvihill in an attempt to avoid being required to report the death to the state of New Jersey. The Alpine Slide was not the only deadly ride there. The wave pool at Action Park was too deep and its current too powerful, with horrific results when inexperienced swimmers dove in. When they reached the area where the water was around shoulder height, or the death zone, people would begin to panic, grabbing onto whatever and whoever they could get a hold of. 
We hope you haven't eaten recently because there is a specific reason drowning victims weren't immediately visible below the surface of the water. Runoff from another ride, sunscreen, blood from open wounds, and let's call it other types of human waste combined to make the water a murky, cloudy mess. A teenage boy drowned in the wave pool in 1982, and another person drowned five years later. Turns out that the practice of stopping the pool's waves every few minutes to check the bottom for bodies wasn't as foolproof as they might have hoped. Only a few days after the first drowning in the wave pool, there was another water-based accident at Action Park. Are you starting to get why it earned its various nicknames? The next deadly accident occurred on the Kayak Experience, an attraction in which 20 kayaks would travel around 1,000 feet of rapids that were generated by underwater fans. A 27-year-old rider flipped out of his kayak, a scenario that ordinarily would not be a death sentence, but unfortunately for him, he was at Action Park and it has about as much structural and engineering integrity as a fort made of chewing gum and rubber bands. One of the underwater fans short-circuited and because electricity and water don't mix, he was electrocuted. The park closed the experience but refused to take responsibility for the death. Some of the park's other infamous rides that somehow miraculously didn't kill anyone included a giant ball on wheels that rocketed off its tracks across the freeway and nearly killed the employee who was testing it and the Cannonball Loop water slide, which knocked out so many riders' teeth that the park guests would find themselves covered in tiny cuts after going through. What caused those cuts? Oh, just the lost teeth of the guests who came before them, embedded in the plastic like little grim tombstones. Thankfully, Action Park is not open anymore. What's that? Oh, it reopened under a different name in 1998, and it's still open to this day? Oh. Well, if you decide to go to the park formerly known as Action Park, at least you'll know what you're getting yourself into. It's called Mountain Creek Water Park, by the way, so if you end up taking a trip there for any reason, well, just keep an eye out for drunk kids and tunnels full of teeth. Want to hear more Dumb Ways to Die? Go check out Dumb Ways to Die Florida Edition, or watch this video instead.